again, YouTubers, to another Game of Thrones recap episode. Okay, so this one was really awesome, just like many of the others from this season, and there were a ton of great things. So I'm going to do a recap of like the top five or six cool things that happened in this episode, and we're going to try to break it down and read into it a little bit if I possibly can. Okay, we're going to start off with kind of the last one and then work our way down. All right, first thing is we have Peter Baelish, who finally reemerges himself at the Vale, and he meets up with Rob and Aaron. Of course, as soon as he gets there, he ends up getting his honor questioned and saying, Oh, I thought you were taking Sansa back to the fingers. Why aren't you there? And then Baelish turns it around on him in a second, Rob and Aaron being able to take advantage of him, as he does, and he ends up basically cementing the fact that he is now the commander of the Knights of the Vale, and they are taking their troops to help out Sansa, which means he's going to end up at the Wall based off of the preview of the next episode. So it looks like right now we have some forces rallying behind Sansa, and Baelish is making sure that his master plan is becoming complete as to whatever it may be. Number five, we have the Lannisters and the Tyrells finally agree on a plan together to be able to mobilize against the High Sparrow and the Faith Militant. You know, we had this whole Mean Girls thing going on where like Elena and Kevin Lannister weren't willing to talk to Jamie and Cersei about their plans of trying to overcome the High Sparrow, but it was kicked into high gear and it looks like they have no choice at this point but to work together. So they end up creating a plan where the Tyrell army is going to march, the Lannister army is going to do nothing in the process. So it looks like that's going to be a solid plan for now. And I'm okay with that too. But it was a really cool way to kind of kick off this bringing down the High Sparrow. Number four biggest thing in the episode, we had Asha go in there and try to do her best to finagle a death out of Ramsay Bolton using her sexual ways, which she did to Theon in order to get Bran and Rickon to escape in the first place from Winterfell back in, I think, season two or three. And that unfortunately did not end the way she expected to, where Ramsay shoved a dagger in her throat. Uh, I personally saw it coming because it was just too obvious that she was going to try to kill him in this way, and if I can see it coming, I know Ramsay as a sadistic person. As soon as he brought up the name Theon, uh, I was pretty sure that was game over for Asha, which was really unfortunate because I like her a whole lot. She's really Rickon's protector, and I think that's the reason why she's in Winterfell right now. Um, she went there will knowingly that she was going to try to take out the enemies of Rickon. The number three best part of the episode was definitely seeing Tyrion work his political ways and through diplomacy with the wise masters of all around Slaver's Bay. Now, I know this is kind of a boring thing, there was no fighting or anything like that, but just like Varys last week, we finally got to see Tyrion contributing in a political manner, helping Daenerys take care of the home front, essentially, and try to get out of this impossible mission she has right now, which is to end slavery. Because the way it's been going about at this point, it's either you die is one way to go about it, which Daenerys doesn't want to do, or everyone just grows a conscience in Slaver's Bay. And that's not how it works. Like they've talked about in this episode, they said very much we have this system that's been going on forever, we make money from it, and they're not people, so suck it. Whereas Tyrion offers a very cool resolution where he said, okay, how about this? Marine slavery's done forever. Just, we're not even gonna talk about that. Everywhere else, we'll give you seven years to phase it out of your culture. And after that seven years, you'll be compensated for all the slaves you have, you'll be, uh, you'll be given a new system where the rich will still rule over the poor, and it'll still essentially be slavery, but there will be no masters and slaves. So I think it was a great deal. It was really cool to see Tyrion go like, this is what we got, then you're not gonna get anything better, mic drop, walk away. And it was cool seeing the little conflict between Grey Worm, Masende, and then Tyrion. Tyrion, I believe, is right in this, but also you have to understand the perspective of Masende and Grey Worm. They were slaves, they understand the consciousness of these people, but Tyrion also understands the other side of the consciousness, why they do the cruel things they do, and why they are thinking of human beings as animals, essentially. It's because it's about money, it's all about power and Tyrion knows how to get at that. He knows how to manipulate that aspect. So hopefully they trust in him or not. Either way, it was cool to see Tyrion get involved other than some random one-liners. Number two coolest part of the episode was kind of a two-parter here. The number one overarching thing of it is really the pink letter. The pink letter is something that happened in the books where Ramsay sends Jon Snow a letter and it's essentially exactly what was read on the show. It's basically, bastard, you have something I want, come to Winterfell, I have it, wait and see, all that kind of stuff. Um, that was a really cool moment because, you know, Jon Snow, after having been reuni reunited with Sansa, after she finally made it to Castle Black with Podrick and Brienne, it was cool that, you know, that was the kickstart that Jon needed. Because right now he's in a crisis of what his mission is 
and what he's supposed to do. He kind of felt pretty worthless. Now, it's really odd to see this role reversal, which is the number two part of this number two coolest moment, was that you had Sansa really be the kick to Jon in this whole thing of taking back his home, finding his purpose of rallying everyone in the North together behind the Starks and making everyone pay for what they did to their family. So, the combination of this pink letter and Sansa becoming a much cooler character than she was before. This is the first episode I can say that I've watched where I was like, yeah, Sansa, yes, keep doing this. Whatever you're doing, it's awesome to hear her. It's great. So, it was really cool to see that happen. And it looks like, you know what, the Wildlings, John, Sansa, and Mel Melisandre, because she's following anything John says, and Davos are all going to be rallying together to take back Winterfell from the Boltons, and eventually that'll end up mean the North will have the Starks born back where they should be, which is Winterfell. It's going to be really exciting. And of course, the best thing that happened this episode was Daenerys Targaryen basically barbecuing the Calmaro and all of his generals. That was just so awesome. We'll have to say, I take issue with it a little bit because I'm assuming they're saying that Dario and Jorah, while Daenerys was off doing whatever the Dash Khaleen, that they ended up putting down this like special sand or special liquid or whatever it was that led up the stairs to Calmaro and his generals. So that when Daenerys was in there saying, you know what? I'm not going to be any of these things. I'm not going to be Dash Kaleen. I'm not going to be killed and raped by all of you. Instead, I'm going to command you. And when they all laughed at her, uh, laughed at her, she ended up pushing over the pyre there, a fire, and it just <laughs> shot right up at them, which eventually burned them all to death. And um, it was kind of surprising there. She emerged naked and unburnt just like before. Now, I, well, I did like it because to me, all I could think about was Quentin Tarantino's and Glorious Bastards, how they just barbecued everyone inside of the theater. Otherwise, it was really cool. I would love one day for them to finally explain why Daenerys can't be burnt. They, you know, they've talked about this, like the dragon can't be burnt and stuff like that, but Targaryens in the past have been burnt. So I wonder what the deal is with Daenerys, unless she's the princess who was promised that Melisandre keeps referring to Jon about. There could be multiple, who knows? But it was a really cool moment. I didn't think this is how Daenerys was going to end up winning over the Dothraki. I will have to admit, I didn't think this is how Daenerys was going to win over the Dothraki. I thought it was going to be the dragons that were really going to convince them. And as a random note, I like to think that at the end, the Dothraki who were bowing down to her, they weren't doing it because they think she's some kind of god for being unburnt, but instead they were doing it because they thought she looked fabulous. Also, honorable mention of the greatest moment of the show was Robin Aaron when he tried to shoot that target. He wasn't even close. But that's going to do it for the video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, um, check out some of my other stuff. I just did a video today, although I'm sure a lot of you who pay attention to the books and stuff outside of the show, it's R plus L equals J theory. You can check it out here if you haven't seen it before. Otherwise, if you have, you can check out some of my other videos. I have a ton of stuff up there that I'm sure you would like. All right, but that'll do it. Thank you so much for watching as always. Hope you have an amazing day. You take care and goodbye.